Ready? Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jamie Bainishi, and I serve as executive director of the Global Health Technologies Coalition. We're a group of over 40 nonprofit organizations, academic institutions, aligned businesses, and other coalitions that are really working hard to advance policy and advocacy related to global health R&D. How do we make sure that drugs, vaccines, diagnostics can reach every corner of the world into the lowest resource and lowest income um, part of, of the world. Um, we're really excited to be here today with colleagues from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, to talk about something we haven't had a chance to talk about with a lot of our friends in the global health community and the congressional community. Um, we've spent so much of the last two years talking about COVID. Um, we wanted to take this time to talk about something else, which is malaria and mosquito-borne diseases. Um, this is still an ongoing um, concern, both here in the United States and around the world. And we thought it would be useful to hear from our colleagues from CDC about the important work that they're doing advancing innovations in the global mosquito control vector borne space. Um, First of all, as we get into the program, just to note, we are recording this session. We realize that some folks are out on summer holiday and we don't want them to miss this important update. So we're recording so we can share it with other, other colleagues after today. Um, I will encourage you who are here live on the line to go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat and where you're coming from, um, your name and, and organizational affiliation or the congressional office you work with. Um, I also want to extend a huge thanks to Karen Goroleski and the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene who've partnered with GHTC on today's event. And you'll be hearing from Karen just briefly at the very end of today's program. And also to welcome our colleagues from CDC dialing in from Atlanta, but also from Colorado. Um, we've got Dr. Ben Beard, Deputy Director of the Division of Vector Born from the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases. Welcome. And one of my colleagues will put his bio in the chat. Um, also, Dr. Audrey Lenhart, Chief of the Entomology Branch of the Division of Parasitic Diseases and Malaria from the Center for Global Health. Um, welcome. And again, her, her bio will be posted in the chat. We want to dive right into the conversation today. Um, just again, conversation is recorded. If you're participating, this is not in, in a webinar format because we want to have an interactive conversation today. So what we'll be doing in terms of our or sort of order of the program, we'll be hearing some updates and a little bit of history from our CDC colleagues first. And then we'll be switching the second half of the meeting to a more interactive dialogue. For the first half of the meeting, please do stay on mute. Um, we will get to you if you have questions or comments. Um, we'll tackle those the second half of this session. Um, and when we get to that point, I'll give some additional cues on sort of uh, asking questions and, and how to do that. Um, in the meantime, you'll see a little bit of a presentation and see your speakers. So hopefully if you look in the top right corner of your uh, of your Zoom function, you'll see a side-by-side -side gallery. I recommend you look at the event in that format. That way you can see our speakers in small boxes, but you can see their presentation in a large box. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn things over to our CDC colleagues. Welcome. Thanks, Jamie. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear, thanks. Excellent. Okay, great. Well, um, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you're calling in from. Uh, just to uh, kick it off, I think probably everyone has been bitten at some time by a mosquito, tick, or flea, which we refer to collectively as vectors. Uh, Vector-borne disease has actually been around for thousands of years, and many of you would recall the Black Death or the disease we call plague. Um, other diseases like heartland and bourbon virus diseases, which are carried by ticks, uh, have only been recently discovered. Vector-borne diseases account for more than 17% of all infectious diseases globally and cause more than 700,000 deaths each year worldwide. Vector-borne diseases affect nearly every region of the planet. Commerce moves mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas around the world, and infected travelers can introduce uh, and spread pathogens, the pathogens that these vectors carry. Mosquitoes actually are the deadliest animal in the world. They cause hundreds of thousands of deaths per year. In 2020, malaria alone caused an estimated 627,000 deaths worldwide. 
And yellow fever virus causes an estimated 200,000 cases of disease and um, estimated 30,000 deaths each year. For most viruses spread by mosquitoes, there are no vaccines and uh, often very few medicines that are available to treat patients when they're sick. More than 800,000 cases of vector-borne diseases were reported in the U.S. between 2004 and 2019. The number of cases of mosquito and tick and flea-borne diseases more than doubled over this period of time. And actually, the reported data substantially underestimates the total number of cases that occur. Have we lost the slides or are we okay? We have lost the slides. Did we lose Lee? Oh, there he is. Okay, we should be on slide five. Is that correct? Um, so we, we have public health tools to prevent and control the diseases that are caused by vectors like mosquitoes. And uh, the impact of diseases on human health often depends on our ability to expand technology, to apply, improve, and evaluate these tools from the local level up. Next slide. Mosquito-borne diseases that can cause human fatalities globally include malaria, which you'll hear much more about in a few minutes, yellow fever, dengue, chikungunya, and Zika, which you might remember from the global outbreak that we had just a few years ago. Climate change potentially affects vector-borne disease emergence. Um, it will likely change the geographic and seasonal occurrence of both the vectors and the diseases that they carry. It will likely cause earlier seasonal activity and a more northward expansion of ticks and the, and the diseases they, that they carry, which are diseases like Lyme disease, uh, Powassan virus, encephalitis, and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Rising temperatures, changing rainfall patterns, and increases in some extreme weather events will likely affect the distribution, abundance, and the infection rates in the mosquitoes that carry West Nile virus and other pathogens as well. And then finally, vector-borne pathogens will likely emerge or re-emerge due to the interactions of climate factors with many other drivers, such as changing land use patterns. When we think about vector-borne disease emergence, it's actually fairly complicated. There are a number of different factors or what we call drivers that influence um, infectious disease emergence and certainly vector-borne and zoonotic diseases. But these include climate change, uh, changing ecosystems, uh, economic development and land use changes, uh, microbial adaptation and change, uh, the bugs, the, the pathogens, the viruses and bacteria constantly evolving. Um, also, human susceptibility infection uh, to infection, this, this changes. Um, often when there's a new or novel pathogen, there is no pre-existing immunity to it. So this can have a big impact on susceptibility to, infect, to infection. Mm -hmm. Human dem demographics and behavior, uh, technology and industry, international travel and commerce, as I mentioned previously, and the breakdown in public health measures, po poverty, social inequality, war famine, and intent to harm. So there, these, all of these factors have an influence potentially on emerging vector-borne diseases. So looking forward, you know, the news isn't really great. Uh, factors that are driving vector-borne disease emergence, they're, they're comp complex and they include all the factors that I showed in the last two slides. Uh, also, Americans are at increasing risk for vector-borne diseases uh, because of travel and because of the introduction of novel pathogens. And the current trends, these current trends will likely persist or even worsen in the absence of effective prevention tools and implementation capacity. And um, certainly it remains uncertain how much um, uh, climate change, uh, you know, will have an impact on the emergence of vector-borne diseases and how it will interact with these other factors. So there's a lot of uh, uncertainty. So for those of us who work in the world of vector-borne disease, it probably means job security for us, but it's not such great news otherwise. So that's one of the reasons it's such a high priority to us here at CDC. And I'll pass it over to Audrey. 
Great, thanks, Ben. So last year, we began our year-long commemoration of the 75th anniversary of CDC's establishment, and we also recognized the 70th anniversary of the elimination of malaria from the United States. 80 years ago, in 1942, CDC's predecessor, the Agency for Malaria Control in War Areas, was created in Atlanta to control malaria in the southeastern United States. Malaria control in those days largely consisted of training local health department officials, insecticide spraying occasionally from aircrafts, and draining water from mosquito breeding sites, sometimes with dynamite. These efforts proved to be quite successful, and by 1951, malaria was declared eliminated from the United States. In the years that followed CDC's founding in 1946, our focus began to shift to surveillance of malaria within the US and to assistance in the worldwide efforts to eliminate or control malaria in countries where it remained endemic. Today, 75 years later, our mission endures. CDC works 24 seven to prevent and control deadly diseases, both domestically and abroad. However, we no longer rely so much on dynamite. We still monitor trends of malaria in the US to detect outbreaks or upticks and routinely see approximately 2000 travel related cases per year. The number of malaria cases diagnosed domestically has been increasing since the mid 1970s, corresponding to the increase in international travel, particularly to places with malaria. Right before COVID started, we saw the highest number of malaria cases in 45 years. And we still take a leading role in global efforts to reduce the burden of malaria. We look back and marvel, really dynamite to fight malaria? However, 75 years from now, we may look back on our current bag of tools and feel similarly bemused. We must continue to evolve. However, some fundamentals of mosquito control have not changed. Our entomologists still spend hours in the field employing basic techniques to collect mosquitoes and insecticide spraying is still an important and effective intervention. But what we can accomplish in our labs has developed dramatically over the last decade. Today, we're an international leader in research and innovation, not just for malaria, but also for other diseases spread by ticks, flies, bugs, worms, and mosquitoes. Diseases like Chagas disease, trachoma, onchocerciasis, lymphatic filariasis, and guinea worm disease. We help states, American territories, and partner countries improve surveillance efforts, ramp up lab capacity, enhance mosquito or vector control, and manage cases better. For example, through a project called VECnet, CDC is partnering with regional public health entomology networks to improve how regions around the world effectively prevent, detect, and respond to vector-borne disease threats. By strengthening entomological laboratory capacity, network partners will be able to detect emerging threats more rapidly and mitigate their impacts. A critical asset to our public health mission is our gold standard global reference insectary, which helps support scientists and mosquito research efforts across the country and the world. It provides a platform for innovative research, so we know what works against mosquitoes and allows us to study mosquito biology and behavior. The tools we use today have evolved alongside technological breakthroughs and in response to evolutions of the threat posed by parasites and or mosquitoes and other vectors. For example, the experts in our Atlanta insectary and in the field around the world have recently helped to evaluate the new RTSS malaria vaccine. Last October, after decades of work, WHO formally recommended the new RTSS malaria vaccine for broader use among children in Sub-Saharan Africa and in other regions with moderate to high malaria transmission. This is the first time ever that a vaccine has been recommended to prevent malaria and is actually the first vaccine ever for a parasitic disease. CDC's malaria researchers have been instrumental in this major achievement. As plans begin to move forward with expansion of RTSS, it's important to remember that this intervention is not a silver bullet. 
it must be used in combination with other existing and new interventions, including the tools that stop mosquito bites from happening in the first place. These are the tools I'm focusing on today. Mosquito control interventions are estimated to account for 70% of the impact we've seen in reducing malaria burden. But increasing global intensity of vector control has led to widespread increases in insecticide resistance, which threatens our current batch of tools. CDC has developed next generation sequencing techniques, which can detect or provide clues to emerging drug and insecticide resistance. We support countries in their efforts to monitor and manage resistance and are researching innovative molecular methods to detect resistance early so we can adjust programs and policies as needed. We're working with partners in African research institutions and national malaria control programs to develop strategies for systematic monitoring of molecular markers of insecticide resistance. Rapid field-friendly diagnostic assays that can detect resistance at its earliest stages are also urgently needed. Once the mechanisms of resistance are better understood, national programs will be able to quickly pinpoint the resistance present in key vector populations and select more effective insecticides. We're utilizing a whole genome sequencing approach to identify and analyze candidate markers that could potentially help us develop these insecticide resistance diagnostics. Along with the work we do in our labs and insectary, it's an equally important to mention that we also evaluate interventions under true field conditions. At our research field station in Kenya and elsewhere, we develop and evaluate new vector control tools that can be more cheaply and more effectively used to prevent and or kill mosquitoes. Some current examples include attractive targeted sugar baits, which are devices that attract mosquitoes with sugar and then kill them, spatial repellents, which are chemicals that are released into the air that then prevent mosquitoes from biting humans within a given space, certain simple housing modifications like closing eaves and screening windows, and more durable bed nets that don't need to be replaced as frequently. These new tools and techniques are essential not just because malaria and other mosquito-borne diseases continue to kill hundreds of thousands of people each year, but because the threat itself, both the vectors and the parasites they carry, continue to develop new ways of evading us. As the threat evolves, so must the tools. For example, we are working to track the emerging threat posed by a species of mosquito called Anopheles stevens eye. In 2012, routine public health tracking activities first detected that Anopheles stevens eye had found its way from its native habitat in Southern Asia to Eastern Africa. Initially spotted in Djibouti, it has since been identified in Ethiopia, Sudan, Nigeria, and Somalia. Unlike some of its cousins, Anopheles stevens eye is an urban vector. It thrives in man-made habitats where its eggs are laid in water storage containers and wells. It's also known to actively enter houses and efficiently vector malaria parasites. In Djibouti, since the discovery of Anopheles stevens eye, there's been a startling increase in urban malaria cases. The simultaneous emergence of Anopheles stevens eye and the rise in urban malaria cases raises the possibility that this newly introduced species is responsible for increased malaria transmission. We're supporting activities in Djibouti to increase community-based larval source management to control Anopheles stevens eye. And we're also helping countries across West Africa prepare for Anopheles stevens eye invasion. And we're carrying out molecular analyses of Anopheles stevens eye from Ethiopia and Nigeria, as well as supporting the building of regional capacity to more efficiently detect and respond to Anopheles stevens eye across the Horn of Africa. I'll now turn it back to Dr. Beard, who will share some adaptations of old methods and new technologies to control mosquitoes. Thanks, Audrey. So um, very few vaccines are currently available for vector-borne diseases, and that's uh, probably a topic for another occasion. But uh, as a result, among our highest priorities here at CDC is developing and evaluating improved tools and methods 
for vector control, or what we uh, refer to casually as building our toolbox or improving our toolbox. And um, so you think about it, and I think uh, Dr. Dr. Linhart summarized this quite well. Classic vector control, uh, you know, is based on insecticide use largely and was supplemented with environmental engineering and other measures. Um, another method that's kind of an old method uh, rediscovered is something that we call sterile insect technique or SIT for short. And this was actually originally developed in the 1950s and it was utilized for the control of pests uh, such as the Mediterranean Caribbean fruit flies and um, setsy flies and the primary screw worm. And uh, was used successfully with, with these um, important, largely agricultural pests. But it's never been really developed or adequately evaluated for mosquito control. And so the, one of the activities we're working on right now is to uh, evaluate this sort of SIT. And classic SIT was actually done by irradiating uh, these insect vectors. And so you, you hit them with uh, high levels of uh, gamma irradiation in most cases, and uh, it actually sterilized the mosquitoes. So if you, if you did too high, it would kill them or compromise them. But if you did just high enough, it would make them sterile and then you could release them. And uh, then the just the male, male mosquitoes and the sterile male mosquitoes would mate with the females, the competent females that were out there, uh, but they wouldn't produce any offspring. And so this is actually a methodology that we're looking at right now. We're evaluating this uh, for mosquitoes. And, um, and there are a couple of projects that are underway. And because it's actually modifying mosquito in the laboratory and making them sterile, it's not actually regulated um, by, um, by EPA. EPA is typically the body that, uh, the agency that regulates new uh, insect control methods, not always, but, but often. So, um, so one of the projects that's in play with that is actually a collaboration that we have at CDC with um, the World Health Organization and with the um, International Atomic Energy Agency. And so the objectives of this study um, is to, um, to produce sterile mosquitoes, in this case, Aedes aegypti. And uh, Aedes aegypti is a very important vector of diseases. It's classically called the yellow fever mosquito. It also carries chikungunya, it carries Zika, it carries uh, dengue virus. And so it's a very important, probably one of the most important uh, vector species in the world together with the Anopheles mosquitoes that carry malaria. Um, so this project is one that that we're that's in play right now. We're uh, trying to get it launched. Um, it would take place in the with together with the Pacific Islands Consortium and uh, probably in French Polynesia. But a lot of those details are are still being worked out. But we're excited about that. If it works well, then it could kind of pave the way for some studies we'd like to do in the United States as well, looking at the Culex mosquitoes that carry West Nile virus. Another SIT approach uses a mosquito bacteria. It's called Wolbachia. These are intracellular bacteria. They're actually found in almost 60% of all insects. They're just naturally occurring uh, sort of pathogens of insects, and they affect everything from butterflies to bees to beetles all the way around the world. And they don't cause, they're not infected to people and they don't cause any disease in people or, or livestock. Um, so these Wolbachia though, when they're present in um, the male mosquitoes, they actually result in sterility as well. It's really interesting how this works. I won't go into all the dynamics of it, but um, one of the approaches has been to develop these Wolbachia infected mosquitoes to raise them and release the males, the sterile males into a population. And this works because the population that we're releasing has the Wolbachia and the native uh, mosquito populations don't have this Wolbachia. And so uh, the, the Wolbachia actually result in, um, in sterility. And so um, the females that they mate with don't develop any offspring. So this is a really interesting technology. Uh, it's regulated in the US and US territories by EPA and is currently being evaluated 
in a number of different locations. Uh, it's been evaluated um, in Texas and in California. And, um, and, and, um, and we just recently completed an evaluation in Puerto Rico uh, where these, these mosquitoes were released. And we're still, we're still evaluating the outcome on that. So I don't have a lot to say about that other than it has resulted in some of the studies and pretty significant re results in populations of, of local mosquitoes. So the, th the sort of third approach for SIT actually relies on genetically modifying the mosquitoes. And so in this case, the, the mosquitoes are modified so they, that they are sterile. The, and the, in this case, again, the male mosquitoes are released. And, um, and, and since the males don't reproduce, uh, the genetically engineered mosquito doesn't persist in the environment. They mate and die. And then the female mosquitoes that they meet, mate with are sterile. So they don't produce, or, or at least they don't produce any viable offspring. And so in this case, um, this, this is a technology that's been developed, has been is regulated by uh, EPA. And um, this has been utilized in a couple of different locations in Florida and in Texas. And um, they're being evaluated for future use. And in fact, we have a study that we're, getting ready to launch. It's in the uh, Republic of the Marshall Islands. And we're doing this collaboratively with uh, PIHOA, the Pacific Islands Health Officers Association. And so this would involve actually the release of these um, um, Oxitec or genetically modified mosquitoes uh, for uh, as a SIT approach in, in these areas. And so currently in, this, in the Marshall Islands. And so currently the status of that is that um, we're working together with, um, with the, regular, with the um, local ministries of health and the other uh, um, stakeholders in, in, um, in the area, because these are local decisions that have to be made to deploy any sorts of uh, novel technology like this. And we work to facilitate this with um, local governments and regulatory agencies. We're, so we're excited about that. And hopefully we'll have uh, good news to share from that in the near future. And then the last method that I'll mention also involves Wolbachia, but, but different from the approach before, it, it's what we call um, Wolbachia replacement versus re, re, uh, Wolbachia sterile insect technique. So it's a really interesting phenomenon. Uh, there's a particular Wolbachia strain, and when it's introduced into mosquitoes, it actually blocks the mosquito's ability to transmit some very important viruses, uh, such as yellow fever, dengue, uh, Zika, uh, chikungunya as well. And so this methodology um, has been evaluated uh, by the World Health um, Organization and um, it's been um, it's shown some very good results in a number of different studies um, abroad uh, where these mosquitoes are released and it actually reduces the native mosquitoes populations to be able to transmit these viruses. And so we've actually seen the incidence of disease drop in these uh, in these release areas versus control areas where they weren't released. And so we're excited by, uh, about that. And we've got a brand new collaborative project with, that we're focusing in El Salvador. And uh, we'll, where we'll be conducting this Wolbachia population replacement strategy. And um, hopefully from that study, it will provide us a foundation to try to gain um, approval, regulatory approval for using this in the U.S. in the U.S. territories. And in this case, uh, because the claim is to reduce disease incidents, it's actually an FDA regulated claim rather than EPA regulated. So we help the vendor by uh, precipitating meetings between them and CDC and FDA to facilitate the regulatory process, all as a part of our goal of uh, building a toolbox so that when we have a local outbreak of a disease here in the US, such as occurred with Zika a few years ago, we will have um, validated uh, uh, tools and techniques to uh, recommend for local use. So I'll stop with that. And pass the torch. Great, thanks, Ben. 
Because of our world-class entomologists, laboratory scientists, and epidemiologists, our longstanding partnerships with local ministries of health and our global reach, CDC is uniquely suited for harnessing our expertise toward global mosquito control and disease prevention. Developing and deploying new technologies is critical to effectively prevent and control mosquito-borne disease cases and save lives. Our laboratory experts and entomologists represent an unmatched pool of expertise that serve as a critical resource for the globe. It's vital that CDC labs, including the insectaries, maintain the highest performance standards so we can continue pursuing scientific advances that keep us one step ahead of emergent threats. Recent investments in global health security and pandemic preparedness mean we have an exciting opportunity to continue our work understanding the threat of mosquito-borne disease and responding to outbreaks. However, there's still a lot to be done. It's urgent that we continue developing these tools to maintain progress to date and accelerate disease control and elimination efforts. Given recent events, we know that the threat of infectious diseases, including mosquito-borne diseases, are not going away. In fact, in some ways, the problem is only being exacerbated. There will continue to be additional outbreaks somewhere in the world. How soon, which disease, where, and how, and how big are unknown. We must be prepared for the unexpected and be ready to respond anytime, anywhere. We hope that you will have a chance to visit us in Atlanta soon. We'd love to show you our insectary as well as our malaria and parasitic disease laboratories. Um, and I'll now turn things over to Jamie to open up the Q&A. Thanks very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Beard and Dr. Lenhart. And I can just say a few of us on this call have been down to Atlanta. We have seen the insectary and we have seen the laboratories and it is quite, quite impressive. So I will second that recommendation to get down to Atlanta at some point if stakeholders can. Um, now we're going to switch to the interactive part of today's conversation. This is why we didn't set this up as a webinar and that you each are boxes on the screen is we want to, to be able to hear from you and have an interactive dialogue. Um, I see that Ellen is already fast out the gate with a, with a question. I'm actually going to jump one ahead of her and use my moderator's prerogative to circle back on one thing that you both as speakers touched upon, but I think is worth elevating. Um, ben, you were talking about sort of microbial changes in your remarks. And Audrey, you were talking about all of the work that's being done for sequencing and detection of um, antimicrobial resistance or sort of the, sorry, the insecticide resistance. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how big of a threat is that? Is that the thing that's really causing sort of the lack of progress in some cases? Is that the biggest thing that everyone's worried about in the malaria space right now? Sure, I'll, I'll take a first stab at that. Um, Certainly, uh, it's a huge concern um, in the malaria space, but in the general vector-borne disease space as well. Um, the long and the short of it is that we have a very small toolbox. Um, and those tools are heavily dependent on the use of a really small number of insecticides that are approved for public health. And once the mosquitoes develop resistance to those insecticides, we're really limited in what we can do to effectively control them. So trying to stay one step ahead of the mosquitoes before they develop resistance is absolutely critical. Um, and one thing we've seen over recent years, and um, it's associative, um, we're not sure the extent to which it's causative, but in the malaria space, there's been a stagnation over the last few years in progress toward malaria control um, across the world. And this has corresponded with huge increases in the frequency of insecticide resistance across many of the malaria endemic countries. So it's an absolutely uh, critical concern and a top priority for us here at CDC to better understand the resistance and help our partners come up with tools to detect it at its earliest stage of development so that programs can stay ahead of it um, and still be able to effectively control their vectors. Um, hand it over to Ben. Yeah, thanks, Audrey. Yeah, you know, I, I certainly agree with all of that. Um, and I, I think I would add that here in the United States, we, we're very concerned about um, the, the need and the reliance on, on insecticides for control of disease outbreaks, such as West Nile, uh, which is an you know, incredible problem. In fact, we have the largest 
uh, ever local outbreak of West Nile virus just last summer in um, Phoenix, Arizona, in uh, Maricopa County, and um, and it was completely unnoticed because of it was eclipsed due to COVID, but um, it, was, it was a huge uh, outbreak, and um, and I think the challenges we have are sort of twofold: uh, insecticide resistance that occurs. And I remember a few years ago during the Zika outbreak, uh, there was um, a number of studies that were done looking at local populations of uh, Aedes aegypti, and there was a significant amount of um, sort of loss of sensitivity, if you will, to, to the insecticides, uh, both here in the continental U.S. and also in Puerto Rico. And uh, so that's very much a concern and something high on our radar screen. The other concern uh, is um, really evidenced by the fact that we have calls monthly with EPA uh, discussing our concerns over the fact that a lot of these insecticides that have been um, labeled and registered uh, for many years come up for re-registration. And um, there's huge pushback, um, you know, against the use of particularly aerial application pesticides. And this is particularly uh, relevant for West Nile virus control in the wake of an epidemic. And um, so there's a lot of pushback to the use of synthetic pesticides. And, um, and I think because of that, uh, we're concerned, um, you know, that, that there is good information. And I think that what we would say at CDC is that these pesticides, when they're used according to the EPA label, they're safe and effective. And so we support them and we work uh, hand in hand with EPA on uh, maintaining, a, you know, a tight watch on this and giving heed to um, the concerns that people mention, uh, but also, uh, you know, watching out for uh, doing what we can to communicate um, the appropriate use and judicious use of pesticides when they're needed. And uh, this is a constant concern uh, for us. And of course, it's part of the reason we're so interested in novel technologies. But uh, we also are incredibly reliant on pesticides because they, they work uh, when they're used appropriately. And so th these are our big concerns, though. Perfect. Thanks. I'll also say from the GHTC community side, we work with the International Vector Control Consortium, and they spend a lot of time just thinking about how do you even keep the market going to have the novel insecticides. And so we're, we're often thinking about that from many, many perspectives. Um, I see that we're starting to get some questions in the chat. So feel free, anyone, to add in that way. Or if you want to click on the reactions button, put up your virtual hand. Or if you want to ask a question anonymously, feel free to direct message me. There's three ways you can feed into this conversation. Um, I do want to go back to Ellen, who's been waiting so patiently. Recently, um, she posted a question, um, Ben, during your remarks, which was, does Wolbachia introduction impact non-target insects? Uh, yeah, great question. And no, it doesn't, because the Wolbachia have really no way to get out of the mosquito. They're, in, uh, they're introduced into the mosquitoes. Uh, they actually, the Wolbachia, the used in mosquitoes were introduced originally from Drosophila, the fruit fly. And so they came from Drosophila where they're natively there. And then they were introduced by injection into the mosquitoes. And then the way they spread is actually through mating. I mean, you can almost think of of it as a mosquito STD, you know, they, they mate and there's this incompatibility that occurs in the mating process. And so the eggs don't develop. And uh, but because male mosquitoes don't mate with other insects of other species in the, in the female, nor the, nor the females as well, it's just in that one species of that one mosquito where it was introduced. So, so it's a, a really nice technology. And it's actually been around for, for many, many years. I worked on Wolbachia when I was a PhD student at University of Florida back in the uh, in the uh, 80s. So it's, it's a method that's been around for a long time, but it's just now kind of hitting prime time, if you will. Perfect, thanks. Um, I'm gonna switch to hands up. I see Jody, you've got your hands raised. Yeah, great. Hi, Jamie, and, and thank you um, for the great presentation. And it's really nice to hear all these things succinctly uh, laid out. I'm a, a bit of a budget geek, if you will. So I just wanted to, A, um, acknowledge that the president included an increase in his budget for the division of, of um, parasitic diseases and malaria. And 
um, that Congress has has been upping the budget slowly um, after it's been stagnant for a number of years. I'm just, um, can you talk a little bit about either however you want to talk about it, but you know what what more uh, funding would allow you to do, or or what lack of funding might allow you might make you not be able to do, whichever whichever frame you'd like to use there, <laughs> or both if you'd like. Sure. Yeah. So. The proposed increase would allow our division to make some pretty uh, urgently needed improvements to our parasitic disease laboratory, um, but also across the malaria and entomology laboratories as well. Um, and it would allow us to further advance the activities that we have on global control and elimination of malaria, and then some of the targeted NTDs that, that fall under um, the purview of our division. Um, and I think really critically from the entomology perspective, um, our division would be able to respond to some of the emergent threats like um, Anopheles Stevens eye and insecticide resistance um, in a more enduring way um, with, uh, with that kind of um, support. Um, we'd also want to invest in some new testing platforms and next-gen sequencing. Um, in the entomology space, but then also across the parasitic disease space for um, diagnostics and improved um, ability to respond to outbreaks. And yeah, I think just keeping our reference diagnostic capacity up to date to make sure that the services that we can provide to states and countries and other USG agencies and public health partners remains um, at the global gold standard that it currently is. Right. Thanks for that. Perfect. I'm going to switch back to um, the chat. We've got a question from Carl. Do we study the ecological consequences of SIT approaches? I'll leave it to either of you to jump in there. Yeah, um, I, I can start on it. Then Audrey can um, can pick up on what I miss here. Sorry, I was trying to find my mic to come off mute. Um, yeah, well, we do, but actually that really falls into EPA's camp as a regulatory agency, and we are not a regulatory agency, you know, we're a public health agency, but as I mentioned, we work very closely with, um, with EPA. You know, I, I can speak, though, um, just by saying that, that we are concerned about, we're concerned about the ecological impacts of any of the interventions that we use, the non-target effects. Of, um, of insecticides and non-target effects of uh, all of these approaches, and they're very, very important. Um, the nice thing about Wolbachia is, as I mentioned, they don't naturally jump between species. And because they're, they're sort of spread just through this mating process through a female that has them passes it through their offspring, and um, so, and they've been around, as I mentioned, they're in approximately 60% of all uh, insect and arthropod uh, taxa right now, taxa, groups of, of species. And uh, they're very broadly distributed and they've sort of co-evolved with insects and arthropods over the years. And they're really more of a, um, a, a pathogen of the insect itself. Uh, than ones certainly of humans, and because they don't spread um, in the once they've been introduced into an exotic mosquito species, they really just stay there. <laughs> and um, so, I, so yeah, I can just stop with that. And maybe Audrey wants to uh, um, add something to that. Over. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, in the malaria space at CDC. Uh, we're a partner in the Target Malaria Consortium. So that's a group of scientists from a, a, a lot of different institutions around the world that are working on genetic modification of malaria vectors as a potential malaria control strategy. And our specific role within that is really looking at some of these gene drive mosquito strains to see um, how they might differ from wild mosquito strains with respect to insecticide resistance, with respect to their ability to vector parasites or viruses. So we're trying to understand if there are 
potential ecological consequences from that perspective with some of the genetically modified SIT approaches that, um, that are being studied for malaria vectors specifically. Um, so far, the preliminary data suggests that they behave pretty similarly to their wild type counterparts, but again, that's, that's a key role that the um, scientists here um, in our branch are contributing to. Great, thanks. Another question here, I'm, I'm going to add to it because I'm thinking about the title of today's meeting, which is from TNT to ITNs. Um, and a few folks are asking me before the meeting today, what does TNT stand for? What's that clinical term? And I said, I think it means dynamite, right? Uh, th the technologies have evolved so much over time. Um, and part of the, the theme of your presentation was also thinking about the global aspect and how you're supporting capacity strengthening um, of countries outside of the US who are working on, on vector control. And I'm just wondering if you can speak any more to sort of what you're doing, how you're doing that work on the ground in countries. Obviously, I don't think you're teaching people how to use dynamite anymore. Um, so what does that look like in the current, in the current times? Um, I'll go first and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Ben. So, um, one of our projects, which I mentioned, is this uh, VECnet project, which actually is in collaboration with our colleagues in Fort Collins in Ben's division. So it's a cross CDC initiative of all of us entomologists working across uh, vectors where we're supporting our colleagues uh, in different regions of the world in their public health entomology networks. So for instance, we're supporting uh, six networks now in Central America, the Caribbean, West Africa, the Horn of Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. And within each of those networks, there's some really region-specific priorities. And that's been the real um, rich opportunity here to, to be able to work with our country partners and help focus in on what their top priorities are in their regions for vector surveillance and vector control and be able to provide some support to allow them to um, further develop their capacities to uh, detect and respond to vector-borne disease threats uh, uh, better. Um, so that really relies on you know, the, the technical capacities, the breadth and the scope of that what we have here at CDC, which cuts across pretty much every vector-borne disease you can think of. And it's been a really rich opportunity for us to work um, across uh, CDC, across the, the two divisions that really house the entomologists here. So really we, we try to um, focus our technical assistance on what the region specific needs are through that particular project. And then also, of course, CDC co-implements the US President's Malaria Initiative um, together with USAID. So we support a lot of those activities coming out of our branch as well. Um, over to you, Ben. Yeah, I would just say that um, Audrey's division does a lot more global work than ours does. Our division really focuses probably more on domestic issues. So we do a lot of work in the space of training and building communities of practice uh, for response to vector-borne diseases. And, and I, I will mention that, gosh, um, our newest and most um, our, uh, our best newest estimates, for example, for Lyme disease, is that there's half a, almost half a million new cases of Lyme disease every year in the U.S. So, and this has been increasing every year, and so it's a, it's a huge problem. And but beyond that, um, as Audrey mentioned, we collaborate with her on some of the global training. And, um, and most of our work globally has been really on demonstration projects with these novel tools uh, to, to try to see what works and, um, and to evaluate that, to get that in our toolbox. And so I mentioned uh, the project in the Republic of Marshall Islands, the project in with WHO in French Polynesia, and the project in El Salvador. And then, of course, in the territories, both in Puerto Rico and in U.S. Virgin Islands. So we do a lot of work there, mostly on evaluating um, uh, novel vector control tools. Over. 
Thanks for making that global and domestic point as well. I will just say I have a friend who tested positive for Lyme disease this week here in DC. And many of us who are out and about in August heat in Washington are covered in mosquito bites. So, I mean, this is this does hit close to home. Um, Karen, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, Audrey, can you talk a little bit more about the uh, parasitic lab? Um, speaking of, of domestic and global uh, interactions, I know that this lab is the go the single go-to source for those around the world uh, with questions. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that is uh, one of the many hidden gems of CDC. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's really um, certainly a, a tremendously important domestic resource for the diagnosis of parasitic disease within the U.S., but also it is globally recognized and technical assistance is routinely sought from our experts in our parasitic disease laboratory from across the world. Um, there's just decades of experience on very obscure parasites that um, you know, we house here and um, very few other places in the world have that expertise. So it's, it's a hugely valuable resource and one that um, we would love to continue to, to build and continue to be able to provide those really important um, consults to, to clinicians and to, to other folks out there that um, need that type of technical assistance. So yes, we're very proud of that resource. Thinking about, um, she's trying to make, synthesize this here. Thinking about CDC's work, prevent, detect, respond. In the detect category, you both described a bit of the importance of your work related to surveillance. Um, I think those of us who aren't necessarily tracking malaria as closely day in, day out, but watching the news are also hearing every single day about COVID surveillance or monkeypox surveillance and all of the global efforts around that. And obvious, obviously there's been a huge amount of US government investment um, as a result of the global pandemic on sort of COVID surveillance and now monkeypox surveillance. I'm just, um, I think the question here is how are those investments being leveraged or how can they serve thinking about vector-borne disease surveillance or vice versa? How can some of the existing or sort of pre-COVID investments in vector-borne surveillance um, how do they lend themselves to supporting the global COVID response or the global um, monkeypox response? I don't know which way you want to tackle that. <laughs> I, I can take a quick shot at that, and you'll see how much I don't know, and then I'll pass it on to Audrey, who probably knows a lot more. But I, I would say here at CDC, one of the really exciting new initiatives is uh, what we call a data modernization initiative, or DMI. And, um, and and these are funds really to that, that was sort of a lessons learned from uh, COVID and surveillance, um, you know, deficiencies. And so there's been a, a huge effort to kind of revamp our current surveillance system so that we uh, to do several things to to make the um, collecting of that data more more timely. Uh, more, um, I won't say necessarily more accurate, but really, but certainly in a more timely manner, um, to have um, improved tools uh, to be able to uh, visualize those data. Uh, and um, I think this was one of those tough lessons learned from COVID uh, was that we, that you know the need for data quick and data that people can understand and see and visualize, you know, graphs and maps and all these sorts of things with a, a real, um, you know, in a timely manner. So, so we're doing a lot of work in our division on uh, a system called ArborNet, and it's been the system that the states um, and territories use to report uh, particularly arbal viral disease outbreaks like West Nile, Eastern equine encephalitis, uh, St. Louis encephalitis, lacrosse, Powassan virus encephalitis, which is a tick-borne illness. Um, so uh, improving the port, the, the um, timeliness of reporting of those data and the transparency and being able to show those and the ease of graphic 
interface. And so uh, that's going on. Another thing, I think for us um, in the in our division, um, we, you know, expanding human and ecological surveillance uh, is really huge and also modeling and forecasting efforts uh, to be able to predict. For example, we have a West Nile virus forecasting challenge that we've conducted and we have a paper that will be coming out soon that looks at the results of that. And uh, the objective really is to be able to forecast Forecast when we're going to have a West Nile uh, outbreak uh, to base that maybe we're working collaboratively with NOAA on this project and uh, to uh, um, utilize their climate and atmospheric science uh, specialties uh, to be able to work together on predictive predictive uh, models and forecasting. So, you know, that's kind of in the, the realm of, of surveillance and uh, data modernization and modeling um, it, this hugely important to us, you know. Um, yeah, I'll start with that and pass it on to uh, to Audrey. Yeah, I think um, for us, one of the the key outcomes of this has just been the development of or establishment of molecular lab capacity in a lot of places that didn't have it previously. And we've been seeing that with a lot of our partners in Africa that now they're suddenly. Uh, a greater ability to do things like molecular sequencing, um, and even something that sounds as simple as just supply chains for reagents. This is something that we continually struggle with, getting um, molecular reagents um, efficiently to our partners overseas. Um, finally, with some of this uh, you know, need due to COVID, there's more distributors that are becoming available. There's more technicians that can service equipment maybe in countries that didn't have that resource so readily before. So that's a really promising outcome specifically on the lab side. But I think it goes both ways also. Um, one example of how existing malaria surveillance systems uh, were leveraged to better understand COVID can be seen with some of the work that CDC has done in Western Kenya, where we have our uh, primary field station for malaria in Kisumu. Um, there's a, a large malaria and pregnancy uh, uh, study that is going on out there um, for many, many years. And in the early days of the COVID epidemic, we were able to work with our partners out there to leverage that to be able to understand what specifically asymptomatic COVID infections were looking like in a rural context in Africa. So there have been creative ways um, both to leverage the, the, the COVID tools as well as to leverage existing malaria tools as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop with the questions at this point as we're running short on time. Thank you to our speakers. And I'm going to give the last word to our meeting co-host, um, Karen Goraleski, the CEO of ASTMH. Thanks, Jamie. And thanks to our, all of our colleagues there at CDC. If there's anything that comes across uh, to me uh, in my work every day, but also on this call, is the level of directions that you're all pulled in at any given moment. You never have enough time. You never have enough resources. And the biggest obstacle that you have is Mother Nature. Mother Nature is constantly one step ahead of us. And if anybody understands being pulled in all directions, certainly all Americans understand it now as anybody around the world. And I think we can all get a deeper appreciation for just how much you have to cover. And I'm so grateful. I think we all are. First, that there's people that like bugs this much to be able to dedicate their lives to them and that you're fascinated, but you're also driven by the fact that you want to eliminate uh, disease and sickness and illness. So um, thank you for the work that you do. And thank you for helping us see a little bit, a little glimpse of all of what you've talked about, not just domestically, but the the epidemics, the outbreaks that we don't know about because they're not in the headlines, and then all of the work that you do uh, internationally. It's really quite, it's really quite humbling and fascinating at the same time. So thank you. Thanks, Karen. And I just I think I'll add to that that you know we have a lot of non-malaria and non-vector-borne disease 
folks on this call. This is more mm -hmm. of a generalist audience and there may be some follow-up questions. So just an offer by GHTC and ASTMH that if there are follow-up questions from our audience that we didn't get to today, something you wake up at three in the morning thinking about following this presentation, um, we're happy to get you connected with colleagues at CDC. And just reiterating, huge thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule, CDC colleagues, both to the speakers and to the broader team who've supported this conversation. Um, thanks for all you do and uh, and hang in there. Keep keep fighting the good fight. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.